The Grenleg Debates, powering bright ideas. You're watching the 11th season of the Grenleg Debates. Please bear in mind that matches, topics, and positions are randomly selected by schools. The theme for the round of 16 is Grenadian and Caribbean history. I am your chairperson, Rohan Bernard, and I call this house to order. And the motion is, be it resolved that slavery ended because it was not economically viable. The proposition, Grenville Secondary. The opposition, McDonnell College. Please welcome the first speaker for the proposition. Good afternoon. Be it resolved that slavery ended because it was not economically viable. As first speaker, I will define the key terms in the motion, then show how numerous economic factors led to the end of slavery. Speaker 2 will reinforce our views and illustrate how the loss of trade monopoly by the planter class led to the demise of slavery. Our cross-examiner and rebuttal speaker will reinforce our stance by clarifying our claims and refuting those made by the opposition. According to New Encyclopedia, slavery is the legal designation of specific persons as property without the right to refuse work or receive payment. According to Macmillan Dictionary, economically viable means capable of producing a profit. Our argument focuses on slavery from the 15th to the 18th century. When the slave trade began in the 15th century, the number of enslaved Africans was small. However, at around 1650, with the development of plantations on the new colonies, the trade grew. In other words, it became viable. Audience, the slave trade lasted approximately 300 years. During this time, slaves suffered, and the humanitarian efforts were not making any great strides. But by the end of the 18th century, these efforts finally gained momentum and the planters loosened their reins on our suffering ancestors. Honorable judges, the foremost reason for this was because slavery was no longer economically viable to the powers that be. Listening audience, from the 1760s, prominent British colonies began to get competition from the colonies, seized by other European powers. In addition to more sugar producers in foreign territories, thus a decrease in profits. For example, the book, A Journal on Latin American and Caribbean Studies, June 1984, page 22, cites that in 1783, there was an approximately 75% decline in rum prices. It fell from 2 shillings and 6 pence in 1784 to 2 shillings and 4 pence in 1786 to 2 shillings and 2 pence in 1787. Opponents, economic pressure for the planter class. Therefore, abolishing slavery was easier to digest by the time the abolitionist cause intensified. Honorable judges, it was a simple case of weighing the profits against the losses, not a sudden change of heart. In fact, evidence leads us to conclude that it was already becoming obvious in Britain, that it was already coming obvious, Britain, that its dependencies, that sugar economy was becoming a less lucrative venture. Lowell Raggett, in his study, The Fall of the Planter Class in the British Caribbean, 1928, supports us with this. He posits that there was financial panic in Hamburg and other European markets. This led to bankruptcy and the fall in re-export sugar from 920,170 per hundred weight in 1798 to 360,178 in 1799, a startling 61% decrease in one year. We, the proposition, maintain that the planter class agreed to end slavery, not because they began to see it from the humanitarian's perspective, but rather due to the strongly supported fact that it was becoming less economically viable for them by the end of the 18th century. No longer economically viable, no longer interested. I thank you. The first speaker for the opposition. Good afternoon to all. You must not be fearful about what you're doing when it is right, Rosa Parks. 
with the opposition, refute the mood that slavery ended because it was not economically viable. As the first speaker, I'll redefine some key terms and present our case. My second speaker will further enlighten you. According to sources of West Indian history by F. R. Ogier and S. C. Garden, speakers at an abolition meeting in 1832, slavery is a forced servitude of every man who cannot by legal documents prove his liberty. This violent constraint is exercised throughout his life without wages. While the master is the, is the judge of, of the subsistence which the slave shall receive. According to www.reference.com, economically viable means that revenues generated will be greater than or equal to all current and planned expenditures. Expenditures, sorry. Mr. Chair, slavery was immoral, unnatural, and unchristian. Religious leaders played a critical role in the freedom of slaves. The Quakers were a pressure group in the movement for the abolition of slavery, and they were always in force in the movement outside of Parliament. According to R. Greenwood and S. Hamber in Emancipation to Emigration, 1980, their strategy was to win over public opinion by carrying the arguments for abolition into every home in Britain, through pamphlets, the press, and the public every Sunday. When public opinion had been won over, they would then introduce abolition into Parliament. Abolitionists repeatedly invoked the Golden Rule. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Matthew 7, 12. Obeying this royal law of Christ involved looking at others' point of view. The Baptist preacher Abraham Booth visualized himself, his family, and thousands of his fellow countrymen kidnapped, bought, and sold into a state of cruel slavery. He was left with a sense of outrage. Anti-slavery activism relied on the conviction that all people were made in God's image and precious in his sight, and that God was the father of all mankind, all nations were his offspring, and that all people were of one blood. Another group called the Clapham Sect gave practical support and evidence to the other members of the sect who had considerable influence in the public affairs. The contribution of, of the Clapham Sect to abolition was great, and they complimented the Quakers who had done so much to arouse public opinion in the same cause. Mr. Chair, all these religious activists fought for freedom. Audience, imagine, imagine yourself beaten, raped, choked, hanged, called stupid, and so on. Wouldn't you want all this to end? If it weren't for the people who fought for our freedom, we would still be in chains. The Society for the Abolition of Slavery was formed in 1787. This society tried to educate the public about the horrors of slavery. Once the British abolition community was established, abolitionism quickly became a mass movement. According to Samuel Bradburn, in his book entitled An Address to the People Called Methodists Concerning the Evil of Encouraging the Slave Trade, 1792, the abolitionists led many of the tactics of modern pressure groups, logos, petitions, rallies, books, tours, posters, and letters to the MPs, a national organization group with local chapters, and the mass mobilization of grassroots agitation. In 1833, the British Parliament finally acknowledged that slavery was a vile, evil, cruel, and inhuman act. They passed the Bill for, for the Abolition of Slavery. According to William Claypole and John Robottom in their book Caribbean Storybook 1, 2001, the weakening of the West Indian interest in French politics helped rapid growth of an abolition movement in the 1830s. Victor Scholzheim wrote many pamphlets and books and was tireless in giving public lectures on the need for emancipation. After all these efforts made by these people in the fight for liberty, equality, and fraternity, would we still say that slavery ended because it was not economically viable? I rest my case. The second speaker for the proposition. Good afternoon. We stand on our definition of the motion. In an interview dated Wednesday 10, October 2018, with Dr. Curtis Jacobs, a local professional historian who holds a PhD in philosophy and history, 
underscores the relevance of Eric Williams' argu of Eric Williams' argument to our side of the debate. Eric Williams, in his book *Capitalism and Slavery* (1994), powerfully concluded that, quote, "The commercial capitalism of the 18th century developed the wealth of Europe." by means of slavery and monopoly, but in so doing, helped to create the industrial capitalism of the 19th century, which in turn destroyed the power of commercial capitalism, slavery, and all its work." End quote. Economic decline made slavery outdated. Worthy opponents, when someone has a monopoly in business, financial gains will be limitless. When that monopoly ends, extensive economical losses will result. That was the case with all colonies of the British Empire whose profits were dependent on a system of monopoly trading between the colonies and their parent. Paul Robert Thomas postulates that the islands benefited from preferential duties to the extent of approximately £446,000 as cited in a journal of Latin American and Caribbean Studies, June 1984. According to Ragatz, 1928, these planters' monopoly ended due, to, ended due to one, new market created from British acquisition of other colonies, and two, from rising and more efficient sugar, produce, sugar producers in foreign territories. Their pockets were bleeding as their produce was not selling as before. Their commodities, the slaves still had to be fed, clothed, and housed. No profitability. Wouldn't you have freed your slaves too? Additionally, more pressure emerged. The West Indian growers lost control of price setting. There were, there were increased duties and cost of production, as cited in a report from the Committee on the Commercial State of the West Indian Colonies, London, 1807. All this happened after the planters lost the monopoly on trading. They moved from price makers to price takers. Dukan, in the Journal of Latin American and Caribbean Studies, argues that the increased production of costs negated profits from outputs. Opponents, it was only when British West Indian planters lost their trade monopoly that Britain condescended to end slavery. Then, and only then, did they listen to abolitionists. Judges, the reality is simply this. When there is a demand, there will be a supply, despite the efforts of advocates. We acknowledge and salute the efforts of humanitarian cause in the abolition of slavery. However, their arguments were only accepted when slavery held little future profits for Britain their sights were set on new economic plunder. Slavery ended because it was no longer economically viable. I thank you. The second speaker for the opposition. Mr. Chair, slavery was indeed economically viable. To prove to you that this is true, I am going to use the following points and sources. Firstly, according to Sebastian Fouts in his article entitled The Dawn of Emancipation, written in 2018, planters had opposed emancipation because they believed that it would destroy their profit margin. They used economics to defend the need for slavery. They believed that they would be unable to pay ex-slaves for work that they had previously done free. The change would severely hurt planters' income. In the article, Why Was Cotton King?, by Henry Louis Gage Jr., written in 2013, Stephen Dale shows that in 1860, the value of the slaves was roughly three times greater than the total amount invested in banks, and it was equal to about seven times the total value of all currency in the country, three times the value of the entire livestock population, 12 times the value of the entire U.S. cotton crop, and 48 times the total expenditure expenditure of the federal government that day. This is quite a bit of statistics, Mr. Speaker, but it simply means that slavery was worth a lot. 
What did cotton production and slavery have to do with Great Britain? The figures are astonishing. As Dassel explains, Britain, the most powerful nation in the world, relied heavily on slave-produced American cotton for over 80% of its essential industrial raw material. English textile mills accounted for 40% of Britain's exports. Now that we understand the paramount economic importance of cotton to the economies of the United States and Great Britain, we can begin to appreciate to appreciate the enormity of the achievements of the black and white abolitionists who managed to marshal moral support for the abolition of slavery, as well as those half a million slaves who marched with their feet and fled Union lines as soon as they could following the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Get up, stand up, stand up for your rights, Bob Molly. No one opposed slavery more than the slaves themselves. There were daily resistance by men and women. They resorted to passive and active forms of revolt, such as lying, stealing, and running away. Revolts were a constant feature of the Caribbean slave society. Revolts caused anti-slavery society to grow in strength and created opportunities for slave leaders to emerge and planters were persuaded to reluctantly accept emancipation. Haitian slaves, yearning for freedom, revolted and destroyed slavery in Haiti. This made Haiti the first black independent nation in the Americas. Did you hear that, Mr. Speaker? Slavery ended purely on the basis of freedom and equality, not economics. Haiti's success inspired many other revolts, such as the 1860 Barbados Rebellion, the Samuel Sharp Rebellion, 1831, the Demira, Demira 1823, and many others throughout the Caribbean. This revolt strengthened the arguments of the abolitionists in The opposition cross examiner. Were the opponent, if slavery was not economically viable, why was it so prominent in the Caribbean? My opponent, we are not saying that slavery was not economically viable. We are saying that at the time it ended, it was no longer economically viable. So why did it exist in the first place if more is lost than what is gained? My opponent, in the beginning, they used to make way more profits than loss. But because of the losses they started to make in the ending, that's why they decided to end slavery. Why did the British government compensate slave owners after the abolishment of slavery if it was not economically viable? Opponent, the mere fact they needed compensation in the first place proves that they was not making money. And furthermore, by the book your first speaker mentioned, Immigration, Emancipation to Immigration by S. Hamba, proves that $16.5 million out of the compensation fee was used to pay off debts. Obviously, there was an economical problems. If it was not economically viable, why was the payout of so great in fact that it took 177 years to complete the payment in 2015? My opponent, exactly. If it was so economically viable, why would it have taken that long? If the slaves were not worth that much, why would you have to pay so much money? My opponent, exactly, they, they are not worth a lot of money and they still cannot pay to sustain them. That therefore means that they don't have enough money. So are you saying that paid labor is more profitable than free labor? No, free labor was definitely more profitable. Why would it be said that many economies would collapse if slavery was not economically viable? My other opponent, you're missing a point. We are not saying slavery was not economically valuable. Valuable when it now started it used to make a lot of money, but the reason it ended was because it was not making as much money as what before. I am asking you is the argument against the abolition of slavery. It was said that economies would collapse, it would collapse if slavery was not economically viable. Why would it be said that economies would be collapsing because they are not making as much money? Why was slavery not abolished in two British colonies? My opponent, well, probably because these British colonies already ha had more funds than the others to sustain it. Right, this proves my point. For two, for two colonies alone.
the proposition cross examiner opponent since its inception many people opposed slavery so why then did it take almost 300 years for slavery to be abolished it took them almost 300 years because it took some time to 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 figure out the conditions of how bad the slaves are treated so my opponent you're telling me that if the conditions of the slave was was good then it was was it didn't matter whether or not slavery continued I'm not necessarily saying that. Next question. Opponent, if you own the business that was going to lead you to bankruptcy, will you continue it or will you start out with your end business? Obviously, I would end the business. Exactly, my opponent. According to the fall of the planter class by Lawyer Ragas, this was the same issue faced by, mother, by the mother country Britain. Either they ended slavery or suffered or suffer extreme economic losses. Next question. Permit me to draw a parallel. Modern day slavery, drug trading, arms deal are flourishing. So tell me why aren't they why aren't the efforts by these by today abolish abolitionists um, put an end to this slavery as yet? Could you repeat your question, please? Modern day slavery is currently going on. So why aren't the efforts by modern day abolitionists put, had put an end to slavery as yet to this modern day slavery? What? My the point. last part of your question. Your, your team stated that abolition is putting an end to slavery. Yes. Currently, there is modern day slavery, so why haven't modern day abolitionists put an end to this slavery as yet? I have not. I have, don't have an answer to that. The first speaker mentioned abolitionists. John Newton was a noted abolitionist, but before he was a slave trader. Or the opponent, why do you think he jumped ship? He jumped the ship? I think he, he changed his position because he saw the way the slaves are treated. Mind you, not all slave owners treated the slaves as badly as others. For my opponent, according to the Business Enslavement by Nigel Peacock and Victoria Cook, Newton only became anti-slavery because he lost everything and, it had, and he had no other option. So tell me, my opponent, this, doesn't this prove that, and, that Newton only became anti-slavery because slavery was no longer profitable to him? That is to him, well, not the opponent, this was the same problem faced by many others. Next question. My opponent, why is it that slavery ended around the same time sugar wasn't making as much profits as before and the rebellious acts of slaves was at its highest? It ended at that time because at that time there was a glut on the market. When you have a glut on the market, there are too many items, so the prices would decrease. So are you telling me that slavery wasn't making money? I'm not telling you that. Well, that is what you say. If prices decrease, doesn't this mean that... The Opposition Rebuttal Speaker. Good afternoon. My worthy opponents, I have to refute this. The fact that it took 177 years of payout on a loan that was needed showed that slavery, because of the abolition of slavery, Great Britain suffered losses. As the planter class suffered due to this abolition, they demanded compensation for the worth of all their slaves. My worthy opponents, according to your cross-examiner, which said that modern day slavery still exists, shows that it was economically viable and that it currently is. If slavery was not economically viable, how come it still continues? My worthy opponent, I must break this speech. According to your second speaker, housing, clothing, as well as food and other basic needs had to be provided by the planters. But I have to say, it was not. As all of these things were provided for the slaves, by the slaves. This housing was built by slaves, the food was produced on the plantations, and this clothing was made due to the excess cotton left back after trading. My worthy opponents, I cannot believe you. I cannot believe that you will put up a case saying that the freedom of our ancestors, mine and yours, was just because the planters didn't have enough money, because they got a lot of it. They were able to wear the fanciest clothes and have the nicest house while we suffered toiling in the sun. My worthy opponents, I rest my case. The Proposition Rebuttal Speaker. 
Good afternoon. It would be remiss of us to disregard the contributions of the humanitarian efforts of the, sorry, in the abolition of slavery. We stand firm in our belief, however, that slavery was ended due to the primarily, to the primary, sorry, was ended primarily due to the lack of economic viability. Your first speaker said, religious groups were responsible for the end, for the end of slavery. In the business of enslavement, according to, the, according to Victoria Cook, the Church of England itself was directly involved in slavery. One of the church's society, society owned three plantations in Barbados. Additionally, your second speaker also claimed that resistance by enslaved people led to abolition, meaning revolts, runaway slaves, etc. etc. But enslaved people had resisted the trade since it began. The only successful rebellion that resulted in slavery being ended into the country was the Haitian Revolution in 1791. Finally, your, sp your second speaker also said parliamentary reforms were responsible for the end of slavery. This is not the case. Our research shows that reforms in the parliament did not put an end to slavery. Bills calling for abolition were meant with delaying tactics and pro-slavery activities, according to the Abolition Project, the Pro-Slavery Lobby, 2009. We, the proposition, are convinced that slavery ended because it was increasingly unprofitable, unprofitable and became greater burden than benefits to the planter class. Slavery held little profitability for Britain and the colonizing class. As slavery was no longer economically viable, no longer interested. I thank you. And the winner is Grenville Secondary. Thank you for joining us. Tune in again for season 11 of the Grand Lake Debates. Visit us on Facebook to vote for your favorite debater. The Grand Lake Debates, powering bright ideas. Vote for your favorite debater on our Facebook page. The Grand Lake Debates, powering bright ideas.